You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. to sharpen those swords. You're listening to Saber Semantics, a hard-hitting interview and discussion show featuring players, alumni, media, and all others who have or still cover the NHL's Buffalo Sabres. With interesting stories from the past and current objective analysis, this show is sure to provide an entertaining and unique perspective for both Sabres and hockey fans alike. Oh, brother, we are not worthy! Exclusively on the Armchair GM Sports Network. Now, here's your host of Sabres Semantics, Brandon Caputo. Welcome in to another episode of Saber Semantics right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network. And this is our off-season thoughts episode here coming to you guys uh, during our off-season. But a lot going on for the Sabres with the draft class, with free agency, player movement, uh, buyouts, and uh, a lot of other things uh, going on around this time of year for the NHL off-season. So thought we'd come on here during our off-season, do a little impromptu episode here. Going to be no commercial breaks uh, as uh, we're still working out the sponsor stuff for next season but we're just going to power through this Austin and I have some thoughts and figured it would be a good time for us to record an off-season podcast with all the news going on with the Sabres uh, in the last few weeks here so thank you to everybody uh, that's been patiently waiting for us to come back and we look forward to bringing you full-time coverage once again come September for the Buffalo Sabres and all the other shows here on our network make sure to give us a follow at Sabre Semantics on X as well you can follow us on Instagram Facebook TikTok all that good stuff for you guys by searching the armchair gm sports network and thank you to those today watching us on the video version on youtube make sure to hit like hit subscribe and smash that bell and to those who chose to listen to us on your favorite on-demand audio platform thank you very much for doing that as well so with that said austin we're going to touch on a lot of different things today but uh, it's good to uh, be able to come back on here uh, during the summer uh, get get together here uh, during our busy schedules and uh, give the listeners something to something to sink their teeth into as the Sabres have obviously uh, made some moves that some people have liked and some people have not. So a uh, pretty polarizing offseason for Buffalo, but uh, it's nice to come on and talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you said, there's they've been busy. There's no other way to put it, whether you you know got the moves that they you were looking for as a fan or not. Adams has been a busy guy. Uh, you know, they went through the draft some buyouts they attacked free agency made a couple of trades both i'm sure for very actually probably the same reasons people maybe were shaking their head for a little bit but yeah i mean adams had kind of told us before i don't know if it was i think he reiterated it in the pre-draft presser but he said at the end of the season presser that you know he wants to be harder to play against um you know you, you, you need more scoring you know they need to be held more accountable all things like that kind of reiterated that and if you look at the philosophies of you and you know the draft class and the way he's approached free agency he's definitely living by that creed he definitely is trying to make this team harder to play against whether that translates into more wins will be a different story but you can definitely tell that they are reshaping the identity of this team at least you know from the bottom up we knew when Lindy Ruff was named the head coach that things might be a little bit different there and there might be some player movement uh, hit come the off offseason uh, with, with the Sabres and kind of the philosophy that Lindy Ruff's going to play with as opposed to Don Granado. Like, do you see that being a reason why that the bottom six was pretty much uh, changed for the most part and there was a bio of Jeff Skinner and the guys they brought in, do you think those are kind of Lindy Ruff-esque type of uh, additions uh, that Kevin Adams was able to make? I'm sure Ruff definitely has some some influence on it, but like I said, I mean, unless they kind of knew at the end of season presser um, that they were going with Lindy Ruff, which I mean, maybe they might have. I know that is a theory that a lot of people have pushed out there, so I guess maybe that is the truth. But I just know Adam said it from right from the end of the season was the you know they have to reshape you know their identity. They have to find more ways to score. They have to be you know a better net front presence. They have to be tougher to play against. And as we break this down. 
kind of highlight some of the some of the you know philosophy changes that you can kind of see with the way this team is going. But there is one thing for sure, and that's they've completely reshaped their bottom six, right? You know, uh, Skinner was a top six forward, so he doesn't really count. But Gergensen's gone, um, Oposo gone, Olafson gone. You brought in a bunch of new players. You know, it's I've been I've been asking for it for a while. You know. Zemgis Gergensen is a very good player. He's been here for so long. It was probably just time for both sides to break up because, like, I don't know, he kept signing here. Buffalo kept wanting him back. Very good player. He's good, probably going to do really well in Tampa Bay getting that three-year, you know, 850000 per year contract. But just, you know, it's it's the same guys that we've seen here over and over again that just whether they directly contributed to what has happened here or not, it was time to move on. So I'm glad to see the philosophy change. I'm glad to see, you know, the bottom six being reshaped. I do like the players that they've targeted here. Uh, we'll get into this more, but it's, it's, it's as good as it's been, it's going to be, you know, you and I are going to be sitting here in September talking about, you know, what could have been if that, that move for that top six doesn't get made. But if you take that aside, the draft philosophy, you know, this front office is drafted. Well, I think they drafted well again this year. We'll get into that, but very, very interesting to see, you know, them just completely reshape the bottom six and bring in players that, you know, if you start looking at all the underlying numbers of the players that they've they brought in here, there's a theme. They're faster. They're more responsible two-way players. Um, so it, it, it seems like they're going to have the bottom six kind of take the defensive load off the top six and free up the top six to be the run and gun style. Because I know, you know, like I said, there's been a shift in the philosophy here. They're not going to be this, you know, ragtag team that beats the living crap out of the other team every night. They're not going to be guys who muck it up and fight all the time. These aren't schmucks. These are very good hockey players who are responsible two way uh, players, but they are going to have that grit, that jam, that, that, that sandpaper that Kevin Adams and Ruffin talked about. So, you know, kudos to them. They, saw what was going on and they had a philosophy under Granado and it didn't work and they're changing it up to fit their new coach and now you know Adams has put a lot of pressure on Lindy Ruff and his big guys to to take this team to the next level because that was kind of the themes that he reiterated in his press conference after you know the first wave of free agency we haven't heard him talk since the second little wave that's happened here but that's basically what he said after you know the first day of free agency that he talked or the second day. I can't remember exactly what day he talked. Yeah. And it, we, we knew that there really wasn't going to be many big changes in the top six and uh, the top four D just because of the contracts and the guys that they do have in place. Uh, there really wasn't going to be much movement there uh, with the Jeff Skinner buyout. Uh, it does leave some sort of uh, discussion there about who's going to be that second line uh, left winger at this moment. Is it going to be Zach Benson or somebody else? Or maybe they go and make another trade uh, a day after we record this, and then we, uh, the, you know, we, we, we really look uh, look bad in that sense. But regardless of that, uh, we'll get into all the free agency, the player movement, uh, the Oilers trade, uh, the Skinner buyout, and, and everything else. But we'll start off here with the draft class, Austin, 2024 draft class for the Buffalo Sabres. And they did make a, a small move uh, that uh, people were want, questioning a little bit there. As, as we heard Kevin Adams before the draft, was he going to take a big swing at a player? Was he going to trade that 11th pick uh, to go and get a solidified middle six winger or package that together, as you mentioned, to go and get a bigger, a bigger fish, a bigger piece? But he didn't do that. He moved down uh, with the San Jose Sharks from 11 to 14 uh, and picked up an extra mid-round draft pick by doing that. And with that pick, they ended up selecting Consta Hellenis, the Finnish center, with the 14th overall selection. And since then, he has also signed, which we'll get into as well. But uh, what do you like from Hellenis, and, and what did you think of them moving down and then selecting him at 14? Yeah, so I want to stress by, like, in a vacuum, that was a little tidy piece of business by Adams, right? You move down three spots, you pick up that extra second-round pick, um, you know, pretty confident that you were going to get a good player at 14 this relatively similar to the caliber you would have got if you stayed at 11. Uh, as a lot of people said, this draft was kind of pretty much wide open after... Well, I mean, it's, this draft was wide open after number two because Becca Seneke going third overall was a bit of a surprise. So uh, in a vacuum, tidy piece of business. I think it was a smart move by Adams. Obviously, in a vacuum, it's hard to evaluate the Sabres right now because of the drought and things like that. So that being said, probably some people, including myself, wish that that would have been the big swing trade that would have gotten them a nice top six piece. But can't really complain when you pick up a, an extra second round pick, which he then later used to acquire Beck Malenstein from the Capitals, which a bit of a head scratcher in terms of what you gave up to get the player, not necessarily the player that you got there. But Hellenus himself, um, 
really, really solid prospect. You know, you, you look at, you know, if you want to look at production wise, I know a lot of people like to look at that. He had 36 points in 51 games in the Finnish men's league, which is pretty, you know, pretty impressive for a guy his age. Played for Ole Jokinen for an Ukraine. And Jokinen said, and a lot of people have echoed this, that he is not far away from being NHL ready, which. Uh, I don't. We're not going to have another Zach Benson situation. I don't think. I mean, Hellenius might have a chance to make this team out of camp, but I, I, given what you know, the Sabers need to do this year and some of the the players that they have signed, I don't imagine he'll be a Saber to start the season. But the, him signing his contract was interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if he starts in Rochester, which would definitely be good for Buffalo because getting him over here in North America as soon as you can is always a good thing. Uh, responsible two way player, good skater, more puck skill than probably given credit for. Um, don't necessarily – it's hard to rank him in terms of where you would rank him against the other Sabres prospects, but I do know this. The second they, they drafted Hellenius at 14, it made some of their other prospects more expendable, which we'll get into later because they ended up shipping one out in the Ryan McLeod trade. So uh, kind of hard to complain because they – I guess you can say they broke even there. They came in with a certain amount of pros, top prospects. They moved one out. And still got a good one in Hellenius, who I think they probably valued. Obviously, they valued more than than Savoy because Savoy got moved. But Hellenius automatically becomes that responsible two way center that seems to be the new prototype that this regime wants to target. And I know uh, some people were complaining that the Sharks traded up to eleven, ended up drafting Sam Dickinson, who we know well covering the Ontario Hockey League. But again, just the Sabers top four is pretty much solidified here with the the guys that they have with the Dalines, the Bowen Byrams, the Powers. You know, th- those guys are pretty yeah. much in place, so there really isn't a spot for Sam Dickinson right now if they would have stayed there at that, that moment. He's going to be a top power play quarterback, and the Sabres really already have that. So uh, I know people are going to say that, uh, you know, the Sharks ended up uh, getting a, a good player at 11, but it is what it is. If Hellenis ends up going to Rochester, as I think it was Lance Lasowski had um, uh, reported that the plan is for him to go to Rochester, yeah. come over to North America, and play with the Amherst his first year. I think that's a good spot for him. Uh, as you mentioned, he played in the SM Liga in his for in his draft year there, and uh, had a pretty productive uh, a year there uh, for an underage player. So signs his three year entry level contract. He had 36 points. You mentioned in 51 games, and he's the as the Sabres put here, the fourth highest single season total by an under 18 player in Liga history behind current NHLers Alexander Barkov, Mikel Granlin, and Capo Caco. So he's in some pretty good uh, company there. And from what we saw at development camp as well, seen some flashes from him there. But it looks like he's going to be a very reliable two-way center when he does you know, really develop his game here in Rochester the next couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I I get the sentiment. I am also... There's a lot of young top talent in Rochester that the new coach Michael Leone is going to have to to deal with. I do understand some people saying like, "Where's the fit here?" Because we know the AHL, you have to have a nice mix of veterans and top prospects. But um, depending on what they do with Yuri Kulich, if he's an Amherst or a Saber to start the season, Benny Prospel, assistant coach, did say they view him as a center still. So you could be looking at a center spine in Rochester of Kulich, Oslin, Hellenius. And those are all three top prospects for the Sabres. So if that's the center spine that they have to start the season down there, I don't know necessarily how quickly Hellenius can can translate, but we did see guys like Oslin, Wahlberg, you know, have not an elite impact right away in Rochester, but have a solid impact and wouldn't be surprised if Hellenius had a, had a similar, you know, arc because he was viewed by a lot of people as a, extremely close to being NHL ready. So... I'm excited to see him. I do hope they keep him over here in North America because it's just, you know, easier access to, to watch and keep track of. But it does seem like that is their plan, and I don't necessarily see why it can happen. I think he had one year left on his Finnish Elite League contract. I know he was on loan to Euchre, and he's signed by Tapara, but I can't imagine there will be much of a hurdle there if that is the plan that the Sabres want to do. And it's nice that he has the ability to go to Rochester. If they would have taken a player from the CHL, we know the rules with that, and and they uh, they can't go to Rochester until they hit that uh, that overage year. So it's uh, it's nice to be able to bring a Finnish player over and get him engraved in the North American style here with the Rochester Americans, and and we'll see kind of what kind of veterans they put around him uh, with that new coaching staff uh, down there. Sepp Appert has obviously moved up uh, to Buffalo to be an assistant coach under Lindy Ruff, but. Going through the rest of the draft class here, uh, Austin, uh, what else excites you? I put it up on the video version for those watching uh, on YouTube. Uh, any players of note that uh, that you liked that the Sabres picked here? 
Yeah, I do. Honestly, I, I, I'm very. I like their first three picks: uh, Hellenius, Adam Kleber, who's going to be in the NCAA uh, for Minnesota Duluth. Big right shot defenseman, capable puck mover, good skater. Um, but yeah, big size. Uh, Brody Zemer, the third round pick, you know, U.S. National Development Program. Sabers love that connection as well. Also committed to go to the NCAA. He's a really smart you know, responsible player. I liked a couple flashes from him at development camp. Obviously development camp was a little bit lighter this year with Adams, you know, telling some of the top prospects to kind of stay away from it, keep their, their regular season, you know, off season regiments going and things like that. But when you look at kind of the philosophy that the Sabres have done, it's size, you know, size on the back end with the, the players that they've been targeting size with their forwards, you know, Hellenius isn't, exactly huge but he's not also you know zach benson matt savoy type he's 5'11 but he's 190 pounds he's played against men um so kind of a different shift in in, in uh, philosophies there obviously the patrick geary pick was the the buffalo connection the local guy but i know you and i know ryerson leanders really well i think mm-hmm. that was a really good pick at 219 uh, cool. not your prototypical giant big goalie, mm-hmm. but we know Buffalo likes has knowledge with that prototype with Devin Levi. Not saying Leanders is going to be Devin Levi, but Leanders was very good for Mississauga uh, in the OHL. They'll be Brampton next year. But part of a really good goalie tandem there, interested to see what they do with him, if they're going to kind of go 1A, 1B, or if they try to move Leanders, not necessarily sure there. But he was very, very good in the OHL, and I'm interested to see what his development uh, path is like. Yeah, I, I really like Leanders, and I think he was a guy that people had ranked as like a, a mid-round pick even like a second or a third round pick to begin the year. And he had a great first half for the Steelheads, as we know, covering the OHL. And with them being in the Ice Dogs division, a, a team that we follow uh, along with pretty heavily uh, with, with our other commitments. But uh, it, it's, it was pretty crazy that he fell to the seventh round. So obviously, um, the scouts may have had some doubts about him. Uh, his second half of the year wasn't the greatest. As you mentioned, uh, with that tandem with Jack Ivankovic, he might be a first round pick in the National Hockey League next year. Uh, we'll wait and see about that. But and if they do move on from Leanders, uh, th- there will be a lot of teams in the OHL wanting a, a great starting goalie like that because we know that they have two very capable ones in Leanders and, and Ivan Kovic who are still uh, very young in their own right. So I, I look at that Leanders pick and I say, you know, it was it was a good uh, it, it was a good value there for Kevin Adams and his scouting staff to say, you know what, let's see where this guy goes from here and. You know, if he gets traded to a contender or the Steelheads go on a long run with him as their starting goaltender, you could be looking at that uh, in, in him graduating up to Rochester sooner rather than later and saying that was a really solid pick there, just like Devin Levi was was a late-round pick for the Florida Panthers and, and has obviously become a, a pretty solid goaltender in his own right already. So I love we obviously love that Ryerson-Leanders pick with the seventh round, uh, but um, the rest of the draft class, is there anything else you wanted to touch on there? Yeah, kind of just continuing with Leanders because I do think it's interesting now. Uh, Levi, I think you consider not really a prospect anymore. He's a goalie. He's either an age. Like he's in. He's probably going to be a Buffalo Sabre this year. I know they signed James Reimer. That's more of an insurance option. So Levi, not really a prospect anymore. So now you look at it, you have Leanders, Leaninen, and Ratzlaff. Now those are probably the three top goalie prospects, the three goalie prospects in the organization. To buy, uh, leaning in had a really struggling, you know, he struggled last year, injuries, his play dipped before like that. He said himself, this is a really big year. Ratzlaff played really well for Seattle. He's going to, you know, be a big part of their team this year. So it'll be interesting to kind of see who shapes up as the next up, because we do know that the Sabres have to sign Uko Pekalukinen. We don't know necessarily if that's going to be short term, long term. We don't really know what's going on there. I do know he filed for arbitration. Obviously, he would be you know, irresponsible not to because he's probably going to win any arbitration case that he has against the Buffalo Sabres because he was very good last year. So it'll be interesting to kind of monitor their goalie depth here because if Lukanen signs like a two, three-year deal, okay, you don't really have to worry about the Sabres, you know, 1A, 1B for the next couple of years. But if Lukanen gets a one two-year deal that walks him to UFA, he's probably gone because he knows they view Devin Levi as the long-term guy here. So their goalie depth will then be tested. So it'll be kind of interesting to monitor the goalie situation here over the next couple of years. That's why I do think the Leanders pick was smart and necessary. I would always, you know, I would probably draft a goalie every year, every other year, bare minimum, five in an organization because you can't have too much goalie depth. So that's kind of my last thought on the draft class there and that pick. 
Yeah, no, I like it too. And you mentioned uh, Lukanen going to arbitration there. Uh, I know people are worried, but you know he's, he's going to be a Sabre at least for the next year or two uh, with that ar- arbitrary case there. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But definitely, as you mentioned, interesting to monitor the length of that contract. And if it does walk him to unrestricted free agency, you know, the Sabres are viewing Devin Levi as the guy that could take over if Leanders, uh, or sorry, not if, uh, if Lukanen is going to, you know, require uh, too much uh, money for them to be able to to be comfortable with uh, with their cap situation in a couple of years when they're paying Jeff Skinner's uh, buyout uh, upwards of six million uh, in a few years. But we'll get into that a little bit there. Um, but that's it for the draft class. I think the the Sabers did a pretty decent job there, and you can obviously see, as you mentioned, a, a shift in the philosophy of the players that they took. Really, you know, bigger end players. Uh, bigger players, except for Leanders being an undersized goaltender a little bit. Still a very athletic goaltender and somebody that uh, Stephen Ellis, who we've had on uh, the Dog Pound podcast, has said that he really likes Leanders. Just, uh, you know, he was uh, outplayed by Jack Ivan Kovic, the star rookie there last season with the now Brampton Steelheads. But we'll see if Leanders can bounce back and have a really solid season there for the Steelheads and make that a really good pick for the Sabres moving forward. We'll get into the Jeff Skinner buyout now, Austin, and this was one that uh, caught some Sabres fans off guard, but some maybe not so much. But uh, as we look at Cap Friendly, and this might be one of the last times that we'll ever be able to use Cap Friendly because the website has obviously been bought by the Washington Capitals uh, moving forward. We'll see uh, if there's going to be another website for us to be able to use uh, as a resource on this show. But the Jeff Skinner buyout, uh, the first year is only $1.4 million. But the next couple of years after that, uh, and you'd think those are going to be years that are going to be tough for Buffalo because they're going to be looking to be contenders, playoff teams at that point, $4.4 million in 25-26. And then in 26-27, it goes up to $6.4 million on their cap. And then it goes down to two point four for the next three years afterward. Austin, what are your thoughts on the buyout itself and then the cap ramifications for the Sabres down the road? Yeah, I think the buyout itself was... Necessary. Necessary is a tough word because they haven't really replaced the top six forward yet. So necessary might not be the best word. But when you kind of looked at the shift in philosophy, the the, the the you know the the emphasis on speed, responsibility, and the two way game that this team now is apparently preaching, Skinner doesn't really fit that. He can still score in this league. I think he's going to do really well in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. He's going to you know he's going to play a similar game to. To Zach Hyman in Edmonton, right? He's going to, you know, score from in close. He's probably going to have a lot of opportunities on rebounds and things like that. And while he's not the fat, he's not fast. He's never been fast, but he is still a very good skater in terms of his edge work and his ability to get to those areas. But you kind of heard Kevin Adams say it: we don't view, we weren't going to use him in the top six this year. He doesn't have that skill set to play in the bottom six, and he never really has. And there's nothing like there's no wrong like. That's not that's okay. They paid Jeff Skinner to score goals, and except for that Ralph Kruger stuff that happened that kind of took two years away of his prime, he has scored goals. So I'm okay with the buyout. I'm annoyed they never replaced him in the top six, but I am definitely okay with the buyout because, yeah, at some point, $9 million for a pure offensive guy just wasn't worth it. He still scored 24 goals last year, so like he he wasn't completely off a cliff. I bet you he's going to score 25 in Edmonton, but I I have no issue with it. Like I said, I take the issue. The issue is the moves that have not happened after the Skinner buyout because you saved so much cap space and you didn't really do anything with it. But the buyout itself, yeah, I I, I understand it, but I do think that Jeff Skinner is a lot more useful than you know some people like I, most people understand why he's bought it most people realize he wasn't washed uh he's just he's not a good two-way player he's never been a good two-way player and right now that's what buffalo needs in their bottom six and he was going to be a bottom six player you you saw it last year he, he got moved off the stage and tuck line and they replaced with paterka and that line immediately took off at the end of the season so it just it's something kind of switched halfway through the year where it just wasn't working for him anymore and under this new regime he was going to have to be a responsible two-way player, and he's just never been that. So I, I, it's cool. I get it. Do you think maybe because of the emergence of a guy like J.J. Paterka and Zach Benson being a star rookie at 18 years old, uh, also you know pushing that uh, that envelope, and then you got guys like Roseanne and Kulich that are basically you know fringe NHLers at this point ready to come up, making a guy like Skinner expendable, and then they obviously moved on from Savoy as well. So... Uh, do you think that the play of, you know, the Bensons, the Paterkas, and then having such great 
depth with their top prospects that are ready to come up from Rochester, uh, factoring into the equation of Skinner just was the odd man out there of another skilled offensive guy that needed to, to be moved out. Yeah, I'm sure it factors in a little bit, but like I said, to me, it was just they, they Adam said it himself. He's like, I don't. Edmonton said they view him as a top six, but Adam said they weren't going to use him as a top six. And when you look at his skill set, his skill set is that of if I'm not playing in the top six, I'm not exactly useful to the team because he's a pure offensive player. He does get under the skin of other, you know, of the opponents. He's a he's a disturber that way, but he's he's not a responsible two way player who's going to give it his all in the defensive end, and he's never been. So when you look at some of the players that they've signed, like you know, Zucker might not be the greatest defensive player at all, but He's he's a perfectly capable third line scoring winger. He's not going to kill you defensively the way Jeff Skinner would and did last year. So I, I I do get it. I do think again there's a glaring hole that someone's got to got to fill. But in terms of the way that Lindy Ruff was going to use him, it's just I think it was more that, and then they'll worry about the rest later. Which clearly that's been their philosophy because they haven't necessarily addressed that top six role yet. So it's it is what it is. He's the buyout is going to affect you in a couple of years, which obviously stinks, but I think they're a smart enough team cap wise to, to plan ahead with that. You'd think so. And hopefully they still will have some cap space uh, in a couple of years to be able to use and obviously to compensate for that buyout for Jeff Skinner. That's going to uh, really hurt uh, the two years after uh, the 24, 25 season, but we'll get into some of the other moves uh, that you, that you mentioned there, free agency and some player moving for the Sabres. Some guys in, some guys out, as we t- talked about at the Open. The bottom six has been pretty much revamped uh, fr- from top to bottom there. I've got the updated uh, forward line depth chart here, uh, just a, a, to f- for reference here. And you look at it, and right now they've got Jason Zucker as a, as a second-line left winger, but I, I assume he's going to be probably the third-line uh, left wing uh, that you would... Uh, kind of brought up there Ryan McLeod in a trade with Edmonton that we'll get into Jordan Greenway still on the roster right now and then a completely new fourth line in Beck Malenstein Sam Lafferty and Nicholas Abe Kubel uh, three guys that were all brought in via free agency uh, or sorry uh, Malenstein was was a trade with Washington but the other guys were brought in via free agency you lost some uh, pretty uh, notable bottom six players Zemgis Girgensons the longtime Sabre that you mentioned there uh, played his entire career with Buffalo signing a three-year deal uh, with Tampa Bay uh, good on him for being able to get a, a contract like that with them at this point in his career you lost Eric Robinson and Tyson Jost who both signed with Carolina oddly enough uh, and, and a couple other subtractions as well um, it, it, in Rochester, but it was pretty interesting the way that Kevin Adams went about for agency. They definitely didn't make the big splashes like the Nashville Predators did, getting Steven Stamkos, Jonathan Marchessault, so and Brady Shea, but you didn't really expect those kind of moves from Buffalo uh, in the situation they were at with their top six players. But uh, what did you think, especially Zucker, he was, he was pretty much the big one, and Sam Lafferty would probably be, I guess, the second biggest piece that they did get in free agency and then as well getting James Reimer as a veteran goaltender to replace Eric Comrie, which I think is an upgrade uh, over what Comrie gave you, and you know that Levi is going to come up and make some spot starts from Rochester. So overall, with the additions and the subtractions the Sabres made with their free agent class, where would you kind of rank them as far as giving them a grade here? C, C plus, B minus. C plus probably is where I would lean. And the reason I say C plus is <clears throat> it's been good. Uh, not great. The move that they haven't made is why it's not great. They're you know they're one top six acquisition away from this being a relatively solid off season. When you look at you know Obey Kubel, Beck Malenstein, Sam Lafferty, the new you know fourth line, there's two things in common. Those guys like to hit. Those guys are responsible two way players, uh, especially Obey Kubel, who's one of the better defensive, pure defensive forwards I think in the league. But speed. If you look at NHL Edge, they track you know a lot of advanced stats for the NHL. All those three guys are all in the high end in terms of top skating speed and speed bursts over 20 miles per hour. So that fourth line, um, and McLeod, which we'll get into later, he's going to be on the third line. But the bottom six is going to have a lot of speed. The fourth line is going to wear you down physically. The fourth line is going to take a lot of the brunt when it comes to the defensive responsibility. Uh, but they are equipped to do that in terms of you know their underlying numbers so a bit of a different switch uh you know Gergensen's did have some speed don't get me wrong he was fast but in terms of guys like you know Oposo kind of lost a step as he got older which you know obviously he got older there but I like I, I like the philosophy switch that's why I went with C plus I really like the way they revamped their 
their bottom six. I think their bottom six is going to be so much better this year. The problem is you haven't addressed your biggest need, which is your top six scoring, which there's still time to do it, I guess, but I'm not very hopeful right now. Although we'll get into that later because numbers game, it does seem like another move has to be coming. But the last time we thought another move was coming is when they traded for Henry Yoki Haru and they had a surplus of defense in Botterill never did anything with that surplus of defense. So until the move is made, I'm not going to expect it to come. But that being said, good off season, not great, not terrible. Mention Zucker real quick, a guy that's kind of bounced around a little bit in the last few yeah. years, uh, played with Minnesota, Pittsburgh, uh, most recently with Nashville after signing a one-year deal with Arizona, and they moved him at the deadline uh, for a pick. What do you like from Zucker? He's obviously a guy that kind of fits a, a scoring uh, winger in the middle six there and is a little bit better defensively than, than like you mentioned, with a Jeff Skinner, and he does uh, bang a little bit when you need him to, but uh, a guy that's production has kind of gone down a little bit, but he did show spurts in Nashville when he got there uh, that he could put up some goals and, and, and be you know a, a solid depth scorer for this team and I think that's somebody that you look at again it wasn't a sexy signing what by any means but on day one of free agency to go out and get a guy with uh that has played some playoff games that has been in the league for a while and Jason Zucker and has played with some pretty good players over his career as a as a solid you know uh depth piece and, and, a, and a complimentary guy that can put some pucks in the net I really like what he brings to that uh, that third line for Buffalo yeah, I do too. I think he's a good third line scoring option. And I do find it I do find it notable that Adam said he, he can play anywhere in the top 9. And he mentioned top 9. So to me that states they didn't get Zucker to be a top 6 scorer. They might have to put him in a position to be a top 6 scorer, but they don't envision that being his role this year. And that's fine. I think if you look at a potential third line of McLeod, Benson, Zucker, that's a really on paper, effective third line. You have McLeod, who's a good two-way center. Benson, who's a really good two-way winger. Four checker, who's tenacious on the pucks. Good passer, good hockey sense. Same with McLeod. Okay hockey sense. And then you have Zucker, a guy who can finish. Um, you know, two years removed from scoring 27 goals with Pittsburgh in 22-23. So, you know, not... You know, he's not going to score you 27 goals in Buffalo this year, I don't think. But he has the ability to finish. So, I have no problem with that signing. I do like that signing as a third line scoring option and the one turn the one year term makes it okay that you had to give him five million dollars i on a one-year contract i don't i don't you can call it an overpay i saw some people saying that but like i i don't care it's a one-year contract who cares yeah it's a one-year deal and the sabers had the cap space to move it it wasn't like they have zero cap space they have the fifth most cap space in in the national hockey league right now so to be able to sign a guy like zucker to one year deal kind of like they did with taylor hall when they signed him that one year eight million dollar deal and obviously that didn't work out but a one-year deal is a one-year deal and and i think zucker is a good addition and knock on wood if any injuries do happen for the sabers in the top six he's a guy that can move up there and be a utility player to move up in your lineup and put put in some goals and be productive there so really like that addition of jason zucker Zucker and Sam Lafferty, as well as you mentioned, for the fourth line. Um, do you want to touch on the Beck Malenstein uh, uh, trade with Washington for that draft pick? I know that was kind of a move that uh, the Sabres fans were kind of scratching their heads at because we're all expecting these big moves to happen, and they go and get a, a, a perennial, basically a fourth line player in Malenstein, even though he obviously. Uh, with his uh, underlying stats, could be a very productive player for the Sabers with that fourth line on that fourth line. Uh, what did you think of Adams uh, giving up what he did to get a player like that from Washington? Yeah, I think obviously the second round pick is pretty high cost for a twenty six year old, you know, fourth liner. I don't think anyone would argue against that. I do like the speed. I do like the hitting. I do like the the fourth line capabilities that he brings. I understand why they acquired that style of player. I don't necessarily understand the cost, which is fine. Whatever. it's You got a second-round pick in the San Jose trade. You basically used it to acquire Malenstein. Cool. Whatever. I think the, the common theme is sometimes like you have to overpay to get a position of need. I don't necessarily... I didn't rank fourth line winger as one of the biggest needs for the Sabres. You know, I think everyone kind of knew. Anyone with a brain realized their two biggest needs were third line center second line scoring winger um a new fourth line was obviously a part of their philosophy and they were willing to pay a high price to get it we'll see what Malenstein's contract looks like um but you gave up a second round pick for the guy so I, I have to think in my brain you view him as an every game player much like Washington viewed him last year when he played 81 games so it'll be interesting to see how they how they use him this year but very fast responsible 
penalty killer, a lot of block shots, a lot of hits. And I know the timeline doesn't necessarily line up there with the Skinner buyout and everything like that, but would you have liked to see maybe a move at draft time if they were to move, let's say if they didn't uh, select uh, Hellenist and they traded a number 11 plus a second round pick, or maybe they moved back to 14, picked up that second from San Jose, and then used that second and a player and or a prospect like a Matt Savoy or that 14th overall pick to go and get like a top six player. Would, would that have been a move that you would have liked to see, even if they were to move back there uh, to pick up that second uh, as more ammunition to go and, and get a player? Um, you know, we didn't see a Martin Nietzsche or uh, Nikolai Ehlers trade uh, yet from Carolina or Winnipeg at the moment of recording this. So you obviously see that uh, that Carolina and, and Winnipeg didn't get the right offers for either of those players. So um, if a move is still to be made like that, did you think that they kind of missed that window uh, with the trade that they could have made at the draft? I mean, obviously, I would have liked to have seen it. Um, you know, that was to me is their biggest need. It was their biggest need to pretty much anybody that was their biggest need. So obviously, yeah, we, I think everyone would have liked to have seen it. Um, <clears throat> I don't think they missed the window. Like you just said, none of those rumored, unless you view Mangiapane as a surefire top six, which I mean, he probably is, but he was moved for a second round pick, uh, but to the capitals. So I guess unless you count him, none of really the big name r- rumored guys have been moved yet. So I can't say it was a missed opportunity for Adams, but obviously, yeah, I, I, I would have liked to have seen that move. And I think until he makes that move, it's fair to question and doubt the off season and the improvements that they'll make next year, because unless they make that top six acquisition, they're back to again, in terms of their scoring and their top six production they're banking solely on internal improvements which we saw what happened last year when they did that it did not go their way and another move that kind of you know Sabres fans were wondering about was James Reimer obviously a longtime goalie with the Toronto Maple Leafs and was on the other side of that rivalry I view him as an upgrade over Eric Comrie I don't know about other people and I know some people were pretty upset um, that uh, you know why would they bring in Reimer when Levi's you know in Rochester and you just need a veteran guy that brings stability and I think Reimer's one of those guys where, yeah, he's not going to do anything flashy, but he's also not going to be a guy that's, uh, you know, when you put him in a, in a spot start here, he's not just going to let in five or six goals. I think he's a reliable goalie. He's a good teammate. You know, he'll he'll be a, a solid mentor there for, for UPL. And even when Levi is able to come up, I'm sure Reimer will be a good teammate in that sense. Eric Comrie was a little bit weird being in that um that more of a mentor role when he was still in his mid twenties. So um, when you bring in a guy like Reimer, who's played in the league for a, for a long time in his thirties and, and has seen a lot, been on a lot of different teams and been in a lot of different roles. I think he adds value off the ice, not just uh, his on ice production as a goaltender. Um, and it'll be nice if he does get a start against the Leafs and is able to beat them. That would be great to see uh, for Buffalo's perspective, but uh, I'm not going to hate on the James Reimer move as much as some people would. Yeah, I'm not. And um I'm not even 100% sure he's a lock to be a Buffalo Sabre. Fair. <laughs> like, I think he was signed if Devin Levi struggles in training camp and has to start the season in Rochester. You have Reimer, like you said, as an insurance solid backup. If you're paying him $1 million, you know, on a, on a two-way deal, so his salary is $1 million no matter where he plays, which is probably the reason why he came here. I, I have to think that Reimer understands there's a possibility that he is the starting goaltender in Rochester if – Everything goes the way that Buffalo wants it to go. He is steady. He is reliable. He's not flashy. He's not great. He's not terrible. He is an upgrade over Comrie. Absolutely. I just, if Devin Levi shows up in training camp and plays extremely well throughout the preseason, I I can't picture Buffalo being like, yeah, well, we signed James Reimer. So Levi, you have to start in Rochester this year because Lukanen's our guy. Lukanen's our guy no matter what. But I still firmly believe that James Reimer doesn't block them from going with a Lukanen Levi tandem. So, not going to hate on it. There's nothing wrong with goalie depth. I wouldn't be surprised if he's Rochester's goalie. I mean, they probably will have to subject him to waivers, obviously, because of the amount of time he's played in the league. But he signed with Buffalo for a reason, so maybe they did tell him there's a real shot he's the backup here, or maybe it was the fact that they guaranteed him $1 million no matter where he plays. I'm not really sure, but yeah, I'm not going to hate on that signing. 
And then lastly, before we move on here, some depth signings for Rochester uh, and more organizational depth. Jacob Bryson is back, uh, which was a nice uh, re-sign for Kevin Adams. Riley Stillman was a guy that we thought would be brought back as he traded Josh Bloom to get him. Josh Bloom ended up going and scoring uh, the uh, the game-winning goal in the Memorial Cup. So Vancouver Canuck pros- uh, people are very high on Josh Bloom now as, as a guy that we used to love in the Ontario Hockey League. So Riley Stillman uh, ended up moving on. But uh, they bring back Bryson, and they bring in a couple uh, depth pieces for Rochester, like Sandstrom and others, uh, anybody you want to touch on there uh, that is coming back uh, for the Sabres or coming in uh, to fill out the Rochester depth down there. No, I guess it depends on who you view as filling in for Rochester. I think an interesting signing was Dennis Gilbert, because I am pretty sure they signed Dennis Gilbert to be a Buffalo Sabre, not to be a Rochester American. We'll see how that shakes out, but... I am very interested to see what they do with the defense because Gilbert brings a skill set that they don't have on the blue line. Not necessarily an everyday player, but I wonder if they're going to you know, carry eight defensemen because Bryson, again, was a reliable seventh defender last year, didn't play a lot, but when he did play, played well. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any moves to be made on the blue line because they obviously gave Yoki Haru his $3.1 million one-year deal, mm-hmm. walks him to UFA next year, so doesn't really seem like he's in their long-term plans, which we kind of thought. So it'll be interesting what, if anything, happens with the blue line because I wouldn't be surprised if Dennis Gilbert plays a decent handful of games for the Buffalo Sabres. And bringing Bryson back as the depth guy right now, he, he's the extra defenseman because Samuelson, you expect him to be back 100% after he missed uh, the rest of the season last year. And then they brought back Yoki Haru, as you mentioned, on that one-year deal. Maybe he's the guy that gets moved at the deadline or what have you if a guy like Gilbert is able to step in uh, to a bigger role and kind of move the depth chart there. But uh, what are you liking from the way that the Sabres' defensive core uh, is shaping out? We knew the top three was pretty much a lock, and then they made a couple additions there. Ryan Johnson, still a name that we mentioned uh, on, our, on our season finale show, if he's going to kind of move the needle there for the Sabres still got Connor Clifton you still got Samuelson so and, and you bring back Bryson to be a, either a seventh defenseman or a guy that you can call up from Rochester so uh you know the defensive core is pretty much solidified I think at this point yeah it's solidified and I am a little bit shocked again that they're bringing back the exact same decor they had last year maybe they're not maybe a move is had to be had I'm not really sure but a little bit surprising um I know you know, it, is, it is what it is. Like I said, right now, it sure looks like your top four is some iteration of Yoki Haru Power, Byram, and Darlene. We'll see what they do with that. Um, Samuelson, Clifton, Gilbert, Bryson, some combination of those four will be your third pair. But a little bit questionable, in my opinion, to bring back the exact same decor from last year. You know, you revamped your bottom six. You didn't really touch your defensive group, which I don't necessarily think is smart because I do think while Yoki Haru flashed, he clearly isn't in your long-term plans. You only gave him a one-year deal and let him become a UFA next year. You know, Gilbert, Bryson, depth signings, one year. I don't know. Maybe there's a mood to be had there, but right now I am a little bit uh, down on their their entire group of six. Obviously, the Byram, Dahlien, Power, those three are very good. They're going to be very good, and, you know, Byram's definitely going to push the pace offense. Dahlien's proven he can be a reliable two-way player. I expect Power to take a step, but I am a little shocked there was no major, major tinkering to their D group. Pretty much, that's it for the player movement. Uh, is there anybody in free agency that you saw sign that you would have liked Buffalo to get, or would you are you expecting some sort of trade to to happen for that top six forward uh, that hasn't come yet after the Skinner buyout? I mean, realistic options that I might be would have liked to see Buffalo try to go after. I don't really know. I mean, they were never going to get any of the big fish. No, they were never really going to attract any. Depending on how you view Zucker, I guess they were never really going to attract any medium profile free agents because Buffalo has never really, again, for they haven't made the playoffs in 13 years. You're not necessarily a huge free agent <laughs> destination. I would have liked to see them maybe be a little bit more aggressive in a top six trade. But, you know, what we're going to talk about next is Adams being pretty aggressive to go and fill one of their other major needs and acquiring a 24, 25 year old center who has some team control. So, again, I would have liked to see the top six move, but. Adams definitely was busy and definitely filled and revamp filled a big need with the third line center and revamped, you know, a philosophy in that bottom six. So I would call his off season incomplete. Um, necessarily is there any free agency would have liked them sign? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. There's yeah. not really for any. the for the amount of money that those guys got, I mean, they weren't gonna sign Tyler to Foley for the money that he got in San Jose. They weren't gonna yeah. sign a Jonathan Marcheseau for the money that he got. 
Um, they weren't going to sign yeah. Chandler Stevenson for the money he got. So, like, I'm not disappointed that they didn't overpay for some of those guys. Zucker is a one-year deal, so it really it doesn't even matter what you give him. You could give him $10 million. It really doesn't matter because the Sabres have so much cap flexibility right now uh, until that Skinner buyout uh, comes in a couple years, uh, becomes $6 million. But, like... I, I I was okay with them not getting any of the overpaying for any of those top guys we usually see in free agency. No, I think the only like, and he hasn't signed yet. Um, maybe instead of Zucker, I could have maybe preferred them signing a guy like Daniel Sprong. But obviously, that's really nitpicky. They got Zucker. Zucker came here. They tried to get Zucker last year. I think he took more money in Arizona, and you know, knew he was going to get moved at the deadline. So I'm not really going to nitpick that much, but. They got their third line scoring option. They were never going to fill the top six role in free agency. Put it like that. That was if they ever fill the top six role, it's going to be through trade. I've always thought that. I think most people have always thought that. So, yeah, I like the free agency signings that they made. So I have no gripes with any free agents they did not sign. Put it like that. About ten minutes left in the show here, so we'll get into the trade. And we got it up on the Twitter poll here. Thoughts on the Sabers trading first uh, former first round selection Matt Savoy to the Edmonton Oilers for forward Ryan McLeod and prospect Ty Tulio, according to the X slash Twitter crowd. Boo, Savoy was worth more, won at 43%. Yay, McLeod fills a role, was second at 31.6. Expecting another trade at 15.2 and indifferent at 10.1. The YouTube crowd was pretty much the same thing, 58% for hated Savoy is worth more. Second for love it, McLeod fills a need at 24%, and then indifferent and expecting a trade 8 and 9% respectively, Austin. Where do you sit with the poll here? Because it's been pretty much split between the Sabres uh, uh, fans on Twitter. I don't know if you want to eviscerate any of them right now on the show, but no. uh, it's uh, it's they have a right to be upset that you give away Savoy. You you took ninth overall just uh, two drafts ago, uh, but it does fill a need in Ryan McLeod. We saw how effective he was with the Edmonton Oilers. Ty Tulio, you know, former Oshawa Generals captain. Um, still a prospect at this point, 22 years old, most likely going to be a Rochester American, played with Bakersfield for the most part last year, uh, Edmonton's AHL affiliate. So where do you stand with this trade? And and obviously Ryan McLeod is not going to be the sexiest addition, but he fills a need that the Sabres desperately had going into this offseason. Yeah, so the only thing, the only thing I'm going to say is they traded Matt Savoy by himself. Matt Savoy by himself was never going to get you a top six winger. So if, if your sincerest gripe is Matt Savoy by himself was worth more, I'll disagree heavily on that. Um, I do think you could have packaged Savoy with some other stuff to get that top six guy. So one hundred percent, I I am I still believe this to that to this day. Uh, I love the acquisition of McLeod again. When you just look at the pure the player, he fills the third line center hole that they desperately needed albeit a very different player than Casey Middlestat. He is a responsible two-way player who has some untapped offensive upside, very good speed, very, 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 very different than the way that their third-line center was used last year. Obviously, like I said, Casey Middlestat, that offensive skilled guy. Um, McLeod is extremely reliable. Um, he played really well when he did not play with guys named, you know, Dry Sadel, Nugent Hopkins, McDavid. I know there was a lot of people saying, well, he was propped up by that. He wasn't. He actually played he had really good underlying numbers with not those guys so this the mcleod trade is a bet on those analytics transferring over to buffalo's new system i am all for that i think it again shows that they're buying into speed 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 they're going to attack you with speed they're going to attack you whether that is off the rush or capable of dumping the puck in and being able to go get it first. We know Buffalo desperately struggled with that, except for guys like Zach Benson and Jordan Greenway. They didn't really have a guy that could just go in and retrieve pucks. Well, now their bottom six is full of speed guys who can go in there and retrieve pucks. So the acquisition, I am very okay with. I love McLeod. I think he's going to do very well here in that role. The acquisition cost, yes. When the trade first broke, I was very like, are you serious? They gave up massive away from McLeod. The more I thought about it, the more I... You know, saw people smarter than me in the scouting community who I respect a lot say, on the surface, this trade may look really weird and one-sided, but when you break it down, it's not. Savoy is far from a sure thing. Yes, people are citing the fact that he put up over two points a game in the WHL, but that was in his draft plus two years. So he was drafted two years ago. He should be putting up a ton of points playing in junior hockey. So, no. I am not mad because I think 
Savoy by himself was worth more. I was disappointed because I think Savoy could have been used with other assets to go get something else. That being said, I like the McLeod trade a lot. The acquisition, a lot. I think he's going to do really well here. Um, I was really pissed off. It took me about 48 hours to calm down. Though. I don't know about you. Like I said, I, Twitter was a, a disaster the, the day that the trade happened. It's since calmed down a lot. So hopefully, you know, you didn't go crazy like I did seeing some stuff. <laughs> It definitely was uh, quite the thing to see Sabres, uh, Sabres fans blowing up over a guy that hasn't even really played for the Buffalo Sabres yet. Um, and again, as you mentioned, wasn't a surefire thing. And it's quite interesting that Matt Savoy was basically moved on from because a former teammate of his and Zach Benson with Wenatchee slash Winnipeg in the WHL played so well as an 18 year old rookie that made Matt Savoy expendable at the end of the at the end of the day. But um, I think it just goes to show you that the Sabres really believe in their top prospects and not everybody was going to get a shot here. Um, you know, you still have to you think about guys like Peyton Krebs who are going to try to earn a bigger opportunity here as well. Uh, when, when he gets a new contract and the Isaac Rosaeans, the Yuri Kulich, obviously Hellenis uh, and Zach Benson are all in that conversation as well. So the numbers game just didn't add up for the Sabres and somebody had to be moved. Unfortunately, it was Savoy. You saw what he was able to do win a WHL championship with Moose Jaw when he was moved uh, there in the Western Hockey League season. But again, I'm with you. I'm okay with the trade because of what Ryan McLeod does bring and how effective he was for the Oilers last year. But yes, we would have liked to see them maybe package that 11th slash 14th overall pick with a Matt Savoy with something else to go and get that top six forward after you buy Jeff Skinner. So I know Sabres fans are pretty split on this, and there's going to be the crowd that says, oh, watch what Savoy and Jeff Skinner do together in Edmonton in a few years. Well, it is what it is. The Sabres made their made their bed with those moves, and, and if Ryan McLeod is able to be as effective as he was with the Oilers last year in that third-line role, and as you mentioned, his underlying statistics and being a great face-off guy, being very fast, and adding to that whole thing, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to see where this trade is in a couple of years. We still don't even know if Savoy is going to going to be able to pan out. So uh, on the surface, yes, the Sabres overpaid, but I think when you really look at it, it was a very smart move by Kevin Adams, and I'm not going to go and eviscerate him like Sabres uh, X slash Twitter was trying to do all week. Yeah, no, like it. It's not, you know, the the most popular thing, and it wasn't even Sabres fans. It was just other <laughs> independent people saying it's the Martin E. Rat Philip Forsberg trade all over again. And like, yeah, if Matt Savoy turns into Philip Forsberg, that's going to hurt the Sabres a lot. But one, we don't know if he's going to do that. Two, McLeod is a twenty-four year old center, not a thirty-three year old winger who's on the downswing of his career. So. Yes, on you know on the surface, it's fun to to make fun of Buffalo and say this is why bad teams stay bad and all that stuff. I get it, but they dealt from a position of strength. Maybe gave up a little bit more than people would have liked them to give up, myself included. But they filled their second biggest need and got an effective NHL third line center who makes their team better. You wanted a trade, I wanted a trade. They made a trade. I'm not going to gripe that much. Slight overpay, sure but you got a valuable asset who fits what you're trying to do here. When Savoy, when you look at, he was basically pushed out. He was pushed out. You have Hellenius here now. Benson moved past him. Kulich is more close to being NHL ready. Maybe you could argue that Rosean might be close to being NHL ready because of his AHL experience. So it's just, he got pushed out. And unfortunately, you know, he was a fan favorite for the Sabres. He was a fan favorite of mine. You have to move something to get something. The Sabres were able to do that and I do think McLeod is going to pleasantly surprise people this year especially Sabres fans lastly any thoughts on Tulio we saw him with Yashua Generals in the uh, the OHL he's been pretty much an AHL player 22 years old yeah. still po- possibly room for growth there but um a- any quick thoughts on him yeah he'll be an AHL guy I mean again we've talked about it Rochester has a lot of top prospects down there they have a lot of AHL vets so I'm interested to see how they use Tulio because Maybe he was just a throw in and he's just going to be, you know, an extra forward in the AHL. Or maybe the Sabres actually do have a plan for him long term in the AHL. So interesting to see. I did love Tulio when he played for the Oshawa General. So it was cool to see that name come to Buffalo. But in terms of long term NHL impacts, I don't really see any, at least at this point in time. 
So, Austin, before we wrap up here, uh, rest of the offseason outlook here, we'll probably be back unless the Sabres, you know, make a blockbuster trade here. Um, we'll be back in September to really get, re- gear up for uh, the season with our season preview show, go over the schedule, everything like that. But um, obviously top six forward is pretty much the need the rest of the offseason here. They've pretty much done everything else that we expected them to get, uh, fixing the bottom six there. Um, and then with the Skinner bio, just leave such a hole there unless they, they really want to throw Zach Benson into that second line left wing role. Uh, what are you hoping to see from now until uh, probably September, the Sabres uh, make a move for uh, the rest of free agency or via trade? I would like to see a top six winger acquired. Um, when you look at their bottom six now, two guys stick out like a sore thumb, Peyton Krebs, Jordan Greenway, because the rest of the bottom six except for Zach Benson, who is one of their top young players in the organization. The rest of the bottom six are brand new, you know, trade acquisitions or free agent signings. So those guys aren't going to get moved. It feels like Krebs or Greenway are the odd man out. Do you potentially package one of those two with one of your defensemen to maybe try and get that top six? I don't know. I did hear, you know, Joe Yurden and Lance Lazowski on maintenance day mentioned Joel Farabee's name. Uh, they were also willing to say that you know the NH- in, in, in NHL circles it is no surprise that the Philadelphia Flyers like Peyton Krebs maybe there's a move to be had there but I will say if Adams does acquire a top six forward this off the rest of this offseason it will really drastically change how Sabre Sands do this offseason because it'll probably take most people's opinions like me where it's an okay offseason to all right this is a solid offseason that sets the Sabres up to potentially push for a playoff spot. So if they were to get a guy like Joel Farabee, who's pretty much in Tortorella's doghouse, played eight nine minutes a game, uh, it just uh, did not be it was not a good fit for the Flyers in, in John Tortorella's kind of system. Or if they went out and got a Nikolai Ehlers or a Martin Nietzsche, what would be I guess your I guess outlook on the off season would probably go from a C plus slash B minus up to probably a B minus or an A minus at that point. I think Ehlers would be an A plus just because Ehlers is the highest ceiling out of all those players. Obviously, one-year contract, no guarantee he signs here long-term, obviously. Uh, Nietzsche would be good. I think I prefer Fair to be over Nietzsche, but if you give if you give me any top six winger, yeah, I think anyone, most people would say this goes from an okay offseason to a very good one. Well, Austin, I'll give you final thoughts uh, as we, uh, you know, we're in our offseason right now and look forward to uh, coming back full-time with this show in September, but been an interesting you know offseason for the Sabres here with the draft class the move so far and uh, you can't uh, really fault Kevin Adams for trying because he it's not like he just made one little move here and there he's really you know tried to rebuild the bottom six and made made that Skinner buyout made that trade with the Oilers to get Ryan McLeod so you can see that they're trying to make some progress here and with a new head coach and Lindy Ruff coming in you can see that uh, the, the change of philosophy as we've kind of been mentioning throughout this whole show um, hopefully is going to be an exciting thing for the Sabres come training camp. Yeah, uh, he is trying. Um, I'm tired of hearing that, though. I'm sure all True. Sabres fans are. Um, he's done good. Like I said, he, I, I like the acquisitions that he has made. It's the move that he hasn't made yet that will continue to be a dark cloud over this team for the rest of the summer. Um, because right now you are desperately banking on, which I think is it's okay to bank on it as a fan, Tage, Tuck, and Cousins bouncing, bouncing back to closer to their form from two years ago. Absolutely. Jack Quinn being healthy. Okay, as a fan, I could definitely bank on that. I don't think it's smart for an organization to bank on that and not have any contingencies in place. So it's not over yet. Um, a top six forward could still be acquired. I do think it is interesting now that it seems to be a surplus of bottom six forwards and no drastic changes made to this defense core. The logical part of my brain thinks that there is a move to be made packaging some of those pieces together but as i said before with this team i'm not giving them benefit of the doubt anymore until you make that move i'm not going to expect that move to come and basically that's kind of what happened with the mcleod trade i kind of think most of us gave up on a trade in the mcleod trade game so we'll see adams has done good not great anyone who is pissed off at him i totally understand i'm I used to go to bat for him and say, you know, I think he's a solid GM. I still think he's a pretty good GM, good drafter. He's built a nice front office. He's trusting what he sees. But his inability to make that key acquisition, aside from the Eichel trade, but let's be honest, the Eichel was one of the most valuable trade chips in the time and probably the one of the history of the NHL at the time. Uh, 
the modern history of the NHL, I should say. There's obviously other players that were moved in the past, but it was kind of easy for him to, to make out okay with that move. But he needs to show that he can acquire that top six guy that they need. And until they do, we'll see. It's a make-or-break season for Kevin Adams. The 13-year drought is good. Uh going to be something and he's been here for a few years now new coach and Lindy Ruff might be his last if he's not able to uh, make the playoffs yeah. here with the Buffalo Sabres and we'll see what Lindy Ruff does with this team but hope we're optimistic that they make a move here for a top six forward here the rest of the offseason and hopefully we have something better to come back and talk to you about for the uh, season preview show in September so for Austin Broad my name is Brandon Caputo thank you to those for tuning in today on our offseason preview show make sure to give us a follow at Sabre Semantics and if you liked uh, this video on YouTube make sure to hit like hit subscribe and smash that bell and thank you to those today who chose to listen to us on your favorite on-demand audio platform so for austin broad my name is brandon caputo enjoy the rest of your summer and we'll talk to you again in september you're listening to the armchair gm sports network